<laughs> I still can't do the big crunch. You got the me you messed up on the Mean Street Posse intro. Way to go, Malcolm. Our first episode, you fucked up. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the Stephen Marbury Show. The first episode. The episode that will not be as embarrassing as episodes of the later episodes of the Supernatural series. But never you mind. <laughs> it's your host, Malcolm, joined by Steve O'Mac. Steve. Wake up. <laughs> because, remind you people, the year is 2013. It's the last day of May. And the chickens have stolen my tacos. And I'm going to have to apparently find some kids and eat them and their Ray Lewis jerseys. Yeah. Creepy, isn't it? Not if, not if you're Hannibal Lecter. Because I'm going to eat them. And their yeah. jerseys, too. I'm going to eat you. And your <laughs> stickers. <laughs> Wake up! Oh, your breath stinks. You know, I guarantee I'm going to get laryngitis from from doing that. Uh, th th see, the, the, this is how I know I've watched literally too much wrestling because now every time that I walk around I'm in a serious mood I hear Ryback's theme and then I start doing the entrance and people and somebody looked at me today they're like what are you doing <laughs> what are you doing uh, <laughs> Steve, you just got some time. That's just how the, the, the chips fall where they may. <laughs> just don't have them crunching your teeth, because then you'll have to go to the dentist, and who that'll be painful. Yeah, Steve. You don't want to go to the dentist. You ever seen that Geico commercial? No, it's not a Geico commercial. It's the direct TV commercial. Where the person in the dentist and he gets sneezed on while he's in his while he's doing the procedure. You don't want that. You don't want a, a dentist sneezing in your mouth while doing surgery. You just oh, don't sure. want. Yeah, but but people don't think that we're just spitballing here. Hold on. I don't think I was just spitballing and eating chips because that's besides the point. There are going to be some topics as most shows normally do have. This is a show, by the way. We're going to have three topics. Three. And none of them have to do with Steve taking a big drink out of what he's drinking. Mountain Dew. Rot your teeth, causes gingivitis, and worst of all, makes you fat as hell, which I already am, but we're not going to get into my weight problems and me eventually bonsai dropping Malcolm after I beat the bricks off of him. Steve, did you rip? Oh. <laughs> I knew that that was coming, Steve. All right, so... First topic of the show is the, the movies that we are looking forward to see so uh, that was left from 2013. We're already at the we're almost at the half part, part half mark of the 2013. You know, June is tomorrow. Yes. We're at a halfway point. Yeah, all the summer movies are almost over. All right. Now, Steve, I already know since you being a fan of his, that movie is looking forward to see. Comes yeah, out. next month. We don't even need to go into that. I'm sure a lot of people already know what I'm looking forward to the most. Although, uh, although I will admit, two movies that I am looking forward to seeing, one, 
you know, definitely at least I'm at least I think they said that they're still releasing it this year. Lone Ranger. And I'm pretty sure it's being released at the end of this year, but Pacific Rim. Right. Those you know especially Pacific Rim, because anybody who at least has gone to know me personally knows I'm a big Godzilla fan, so kaiju movies like that, I'm very excited to see what Guillermo del Toro is going to do with that. Yeah, you know, I was me and Chris was not too long ago talking about Pacific Rim, because they show, now that they're starting to show the TV spots for the movie, uh, we were sitting down, we was watching um, Raw, and our uncle saw, and he was like, what's it about? And... You know, Chris was like, hey, about, about the kaijus. Here called uncle. What? <laughs> Godzilla. That's what they. That's what it's called. So you got to sometimes. Seems like you got to bring up the fact that it's based off of, you know, the flicks like Godzilla and so. Because we just say kaiju to, or uh, you know, somebody that doesn't know the in depth stuff. Gonna yeah, if thing. they don't understand the terminology, you know, you got to explain, oh, yeah, you know, you ever seen Ultraman or Godzilla or anything like that? You know, that's what they would consider, you know, a kaiju. I said, on a certain level, you could consider Power Rangers kind of in that category since at the end of every episode, they use the Megazords, you know, giant robots fighting monsters. You can consider Voltron in a way. Yeah, Voltron's another one. Gigantor. You know that. You know the those kinds of flicks. But it is a film that I am looking forward to from first seeing um, the trailer not too long ago. But there's one movie where I'm not really looking forward to seeing it. But we already have our first copycat movie of 2013. Um, the movie I'm talking about. Um, I saw first saw the first TV spot for it this Monday, this past Monday, and immediately I said to myself, "Wait a minute! I've seen this flick before, and this flick has come out not too long ago." The movie I'm talking about is White House Down, featuring Channing Tatum and Jamie Foxx. I immediately saw that TV spot and I said, "Wait a minute! Why does this just look like?" Olympus Has Fallen Again, which is a movie I did want to see. Unfortunately, I didn't get the chance to. And immediately, that's a, I looked, oh, go ahead, Steve. No, I was going to say, that's was my exact thought, Malcolm. I'm like, okay, is this a made-for-TV movie? Is this like an actual movie? I'm looking at that, I'm like, man, didn't we already have this movie with Clive Owen? That was honestly my first thought. I'm like, I'm like man, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm looking at these flicks and I'm thinking to myself, you know, between these two, and I'm like, okay, I can understand Olympus is down, you know, Clive Owen's character, but Gerard really, Butler. what? What? Gerard Butler. Was that really Gerard Butler? Mm -hmm. I don't know. For some odd reason, I always get those two confused. You would th you would find that a little weird that I would get those two guys confused. No, because Maybe. most of the time they have the same hairstyles in their movies. <laughs> yeah, and like they always seem to star in movies that are very similar to each other. You know, but anyway, you know, I yeah, I looked at that. I'm like, okay, I can deal with Olympus is Down because that seemed, you know, the better one. But I'm looking at, okay, you know, White House Down. I'm like, so they made a movie that's a copy of another movie that's basically supposed to star the pretty boy Duke from G.I. Joe. Yeah, I don't see this formula not failing and people, you know, crying wolf, so to speak. Yeah, and make matters worse, it came out the same year. <laughs> yeah, that's what... That, and plus, okay, so what is this, basically? We're going to have a third movie at the end, at the end of the year, Malcolm? Oh yeah, we you th oh yeah, you saw Olympus is down. You saw White House down. You saw Washington Monument gank rape on on like, you know, Skinamax. 
It's like, what is with Washington and the White House being attacked in every that, damn movie? That is exactly because that exactly what I was about to say. Because in, Independence Day, I could accept that because it was an alien invasion, and plus, and plus, you know, as as unpatriotic or sacrilegious as it sounds, I'm sorry. That CG shot of it getting blown up is probably the coolest thing to me, and that was in the '90s. Yeah, because it was like boom. Yeah, you got you got Independence Day. You know, after Independence Day with the White House, you know, you really wasn't seeing anybody else doing you know, a lot of White House destruction scenes. Okay, Olympus is falling. Okay, Morgan Freeman's character maybe wasn't the President Aaron Eckhart was, but even when I saw the White um, White House down, and I saw the title text, I was like. The title text for White for White House Down looks like the same title text for Olympus is Fallen. Like they basically just put okay, let's erase Olympus White Fallen. Okay, let's add House Down. Oh no! Oh, oh no! Wait, no, I got it. The, there's going to be a third movie, Malcolm, and it's going to actually feature Alpha Cat from YouTube playing Barack Obama, and he's going to use Kung Fu, and they're going to make it like a black exploitation movie. It's a uh, it's. It's going to be called Barack Yo Mama. <laughs> or Barack the World. Be a play on from Rock Rock the World. But, but yeah, it's it just like I remember um, after um, Battle, Los Angeles came out. Sci Fi did their own copycat movie just called Bomb. Um, no, actually, it was Battle LA, but sci fi just put Battle Los Angeles. And I'm thinking, um, man, this is a real copy. The only thing you did was just not use the initials, the abbreviation of Los Angeles, just put it all out there, Los Angeles. And you know what? They're doing a third copy guy movie that they did Battlefield Earth. It's like, man. And here's the twisted part of that movie that makes no damn sense. This is what I love about B-movies, Malcolm. The text says Battlefield Earth. You think, okay, the aliens and the humans are going to fight on Earth. No, they're fighting on, like, fucking Venus or something for the fate of humanity. I'm like, how can you fight on another planet and have the title of your movie be Battlefield Earth? That's like... That, that's like, you know, saying that, you know... Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll give you an example of that. It's like, you know, Green Lantern is supposed to be a you know, a galactic, you know, type of hero, but yet in the movie, you know, it took more part took more place in Earth than it did outside of Earth. <laughs> but wait, let's not forget about about the shameless plug for the Hot Wheels set in the movie. That's right. It's like, hey, how can you tell that it's Hot Wheels? Oh, look, you got those turnpipes. That oozes Hot Wheels. Oh, 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 no, wait, no, and let's and let's see the helicopters driving in what looks like a sports type car, like the like you know the little Hot Wheels sets have. Shameless plug. The only, you know what? Better yet, I say if the Ryan Reynolds Green Lantern movie has to do that, then the Christian Bale Batman movie should have had like you know Batman on the Super Street Bat Luge or something, just to shamelessly plug that toy. Also, also, all well, starting from the starting from the, um, dark, the Dark Knight, those from the Dark Knight on to Dark Knight Rises, you know what they could have plugged? Not even a toy. They could have did a good job plugging Halls or Ricola. Or Mentos. Mentos better, Mentos better. Yeah, but, but, because, th because think about it, in that scene with Morgan Freeman, William Freeman could have popped a mental and hey, look, there's a shameless ad. But don't forget, Steve, we all know who was the real villain of the Batman Nolan films, right? And, hey, I can't blame for having enough of Bruce's shit. That's why he left. Yeah. As our good buddy Kyle, Mr. Lowe, who is watching as we speak, he's under the impression that it is Alfred. Michael Caine. That's right. Isn't that, isn't that right, Kyle? 
you and your and your false accusations just because now I'm not gonna lie. You know, it is true that finally, you know, same time somebody said goodbye to Alfred. Yeah. Nine times out of ten, something went on something bad went on to happen to them. Rachel, boom, exploded. Which Chris actually found to be funny. I mean, okay, we in the movie theaters. You know, uh, uh, <laughs> it, 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 it was save but boom! Oh, oh hit the Chris! Ah, 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 do not explode. <laughs> Don't worry, Harvey. They will say, "Boom!" I'm like, "Oh!" Here comes no, uh, no, no. Here's what. No, I, I think what made the Dark Knight really funny is the fact that okay, they got oil spilling out of there, and just happened after a barrel explode should have taken half of Harvey's face. Oh, it only burns one side of his face that happened to get <laughs> creased by oil. I'm like, oh. I'm like, oh, really? That's how we're gonna make him two face? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was like, so wait a minute. I understand he fell on one side, but you trying to tell me that it, that that whole side got so got so soaked up with oil that when it the explosion, ah ah, it's like clearly next you can see, next you can see the halfway mark of where the fire was burning. Like the fire was saying, I'm not going to touch that side, so I'm going to stay on this side. <laughs> You know what's even funnier? Batman doesn't even try to go. <laughs> he doesn't even, hey, stop, drop, and roll. He just, oh, my God. Saw this no, guy. he doesn't even try to throw his cape over him and try to give smoke signals. Right. Right. I, I but, can see that scene now. Oh, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm trying to create smoke signals. I'm trying to get the Gotham, like, you know, fire department here. Batman, wrap him up in your cape and stop, drop, and roll him. No, nah, this will be quicker. Oh, oh no. You know how much you know how tiresome it is to do that. Man. But nevertheless, we're kind of getting off topic. But yeah, we just went on We went on an aside that we, that really we shouldn't have got on, but still was funny. Right. But um, another movie that um, out of 2013 that um, I'm looking forward to seeing is actually a comedy. It, 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 it's coming out. It, it's not far from coming out. Um, this is the end. <laughs> With uh, you know, oh hell no. <laughs> in the word, you know, in the words of Daniel Bryan, no. Come on, no. Steve. You know, you know that could, you know that could be a good. That could be a good concept for a YouTuber's three film. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I just I looked at that. I'll admit the only part that even Ramoli made me laugh was in that trailer. You know, it's like you know, it's like, yeah, you guys I, I trust you guys. That's why you're here in my house. So if you think and my house is a part of me, so technically you're in me. I always started laughing, I'm like I'm like, man, how could James Franco say that without like not busting out laughing, knowing the innuendo that he's making? You just and you see Seth Rogen's dumbass just sitting there like, uh, yeah, we're inside of you, and you just actually see the McLovin or whoever the hell that was right beside him, just sitting there going like, yeah, yeah. Don't forget, Steve. I know what I'm telling you right now. If the only thing that would have made that better is if during that party scene, Malcolm, we sh they could have had they should have had Tony with like underwear on his head going, ah. wow, like you know, <laughs> black. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on, I'm just trying to make sure something. Just making sure. Uh, I'm trying to find it. Hold on. Where is it? Uh, uh in the house. Bye, bye. Oh. But um, you know, if I'm not able to find, you know, if we go, me and Chris go to see Man, Man of Steel in the movie theater, and there is a, uh, you know, the seats are packed. Let me tell you something. I will find one. <laughs> I have to admit that's the one part of the trailer that always makes me laugh. It's like literally, I love the scenes. Like yeah, you know, the fate of the world is in your hands, and I'm thinking. Oh, now you want to be serious, Michael Shannon. 
after in the last trailer, you're like, you think your son is saved? I will find him. I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, yo, are you channeling, channeling like Luke Kang from MK9? We, looking at Ra- looking at Raiden at the end, we are in a maze. <laughs> uh, like, you, like you did the head tilt, head tilt and everything, Malcolm. I'm like, really? Yeah. Man. But you know what? But but you know what though? Looking at the gifts, like all the gifts and all the stuff that people have been posting online, it's like this looks to be good. A lot of people underrate that you know Zack Snyder, but you know, let's look at his film track that has been for the most part, pretty successful, or done pretty well. He's done 300, he's done Watchmen, and yeah, okay, Sucker Punch wasn't his best movie. I have yet to see that, but Zack Snyder is one of those directors that he tries to stay very, very close to the source material as best he can, but also try to add a new twist on it. I mean, look at Watchmen. I mean, okay, minus, you know, the ending. Verbatim, he followed the book, which is kind of polarizing to some people, but I look at it this way. People that have never read the book, Malcolm, they got to actually verbatim. And since you watch the movie, that's it. That's the book. People don't have to go out. They don't have to read the book or anything. So I was okay with that. Same thing with 300. You know, it, it to me, it doesn't really bother me the way that he does it. And plus... From what I've seen thus far, especially some of the action scenes when like Superman's punching, it's like, yeah, th- this looks like the Superman movie at least that Man, we all wanted. So Superman punching, I feel every hit. I'm like, ooh, that's what I'm supposed. And you to also be. see the air dissipate when he punches Zod. Mm-hmm. But um, another movie. I'm really to come out soon, you know. And I'm really intrigued about the content because at first Chris told me about it and that's the purge. And I find I was like, this looks pretty interesting. The concept, the you know, concept government like. so has been so Yeah, but you know, once again I'm not It's I'm not one of those movies movie, that you but, look at it and you kind of can tell, you know, the concept looks good, but the execution might not come out the way that the filmmaker would want. Right, that's what I was about to say. I'm like, you know, we've seen play movies where the concept was good, but the execution, you know, just didn't pan out right. We even see some dude going just a little, little psyched out. We even see some games, for instance, a game that that brings that comes to mind for me is um, Turning Point, um, um, Sons, of, Sons of Liberty. Uh, oh, yeah, Turning Point. Yeah, it was Turning Point, Sons of Liberty. They had a good concept, but, you know, the execution at some points of it was kind of lackluster. I can agree, since I actually do own that game. It it, it kind of felt like, you know, it, it fell in a lot of areas. I think, uh, I think another game that really, to me, kind of, you know, you know, didn't really pan out as much as I honestly thought it would. Actually, one game, oh, excuse me, one game that I actually thought wasn't going to be all that great due to the fact that it's almost nearly completely interactive was Osura's Wrath. It's like, okay, the, the majority of the game's like fully interactable. It's like, what's the point of playing the game? But the thing that pushed it to one of my top five favorite games was the fact of the story, and that's always something important, whether it's in a movie, a video game, or anything. If right. you have an interesting story, it more than makes up for everything else, especially the characters. That's why, you know, Mass Effect's a great example of that. In Mass Effect, when you interacted with people, you genuinely felt for those characters. You traveled with those characters. Even if it was a character that was only for one single game, you kind of really, they kind of really invoked a certain emotion in you, and that's what and that's what I think is kind of missing in most like creative, you know, fronts, whether it be in movies or games or anything. You yeah. have to tell a story or make characters that you can actually either hate or relate to or sympathize. Right. You know, it's also not a lot of things come to mind. With you also got to have a good story, and also, even if the story itself. It's not all that good. One, you gotta have good dialogue. Two, two, 
it's always been a great case of and that a good villain makes the plot. You have a strong enough villain, you can keep everybody interested. You know, uh, uh, you know, one of the many, you know, great points. One of the many great points in, in film, I think, in terms of interesting villains. You know, one villain that's really interesting, and yeah, it is comic book based, but, you know, look at Tom Hedleston's Loki. That's a character that, whether you love him or hate him, you have to like him as a villain because he is true to the comic book Loki. He's cold, he's calculating, he knows how to play people. Mm. And that's what makes him, and that's what's kind of made him a very cool villain and a very awesome villain for people is that, you know, you sympathize with him because of his backstory, but at the same time, you see him cross those lines to where it's like, okay, this guy can't be redeemed. You know, he's full on a villain. Well, it's good that you bring that up because, oh, yeah, we got Thor The Dark World this November. I know. A lot of people are talking about how, you know, they like the plot line that Thor's going to Loki for help. I'm I'm very intrigued to see how, how when that movie comes out, how that subplot's going to play out. Oh, yeah. Hey, Steve, do you know that in, that in the Garden of the Galaxy, the Nova Corp is going to be mentioned and that, actually be in the movie? You know, that's what I actually heard, and that Glenn Close is supposed to be, you know, related to that, which, you know, that that may, has me have mixed feelings, because knowing the rate that the comics are doing now, it's probably not going to be Richard Ryder who becomes the cinematic Nova, it's probably going to be Sam Alexander, which... You know, I got you know I got nothing against Sam and anybody who really likes that character, but the Nova fanboy, the biased fanboy in me, wants Richard Ryder to be the very first like Nova that they put in the cinematic universe for Marvel, because it just feels right. It feels like you should start with Ryder, then go to Alexander afterwards. Yeah, we don't want nobody falling on the, you know, laying, laying, uh, laying on their backs, which hopefully Wolverine doesn't do in the Wolverine yeah. sequel. You know, and you know that it's kind of like you know the same could be said for Green Lantern. I got nothing against Hal, but you know, I I got nothing against Guy or John either. I think you know John was very cool, but I gotta yeah. say it. Yeah, it's like, when is Kyle going to get any love? <laughs> I always hear Chris, man, no love for Kyle. No love. Chris always yeah, said, but, no love for Kyle. But you know what, though? Uh, any, but anyway, getting, you know, focusing back onto the, onto the matter at hand. You know, the Wolverine, I'm hoping that it does better than Origins did, although there's a lot of people that are stigmatizing it because of that, and I don't blame them. The biggest thing that kind of makes me laugh is Silver Samurai. When I heard that they were saying, oh yeah, they're going to put Silver Samurai in there, you know, I got really giddy. Then I found out that apparently somewhere in the studios over in Japan, they had leftover, like, Super Sentai shit, so they made, in a sense, like, you know, Silver Samurai, a miniature oh. me Megazord. I'm like, I'm like, okay, so he's, wait a minute. And here's what I love. Wait, 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 hold on, Steve. Oh, shoot. I didn't even know. Hey, Deanna. Deanna's watching. Um. Hey, D. No, but it, here, here's the logic that I love, Malcolm. Here's what I really love. Oh, yeah. We don't want to put the actual Silver Samurai because we feel that it'll be too goofy to have a guy in samurai armor fighting Wolverine. Okay, so you, okay, so you go from a guy who, well... Okay, so you go from a guy that's going to be in traditional samurai armor fighting Wolverine. You find that ridiculous. But you're going to create a 10-foot tall like mech suit or mechanized robot samurai to fight Wolverine. Uh, let's see. You go from one ridiculous over-the-top thing to something completely ridiculous and over-the-top. I can't really discern the difference. But you know what's funny? Because they found that I don't know for sure. I'm just hearing from you. If they found just some of our being his in his normal, you know, authentic look being ridiculous. But wait a minute. I thought a decade ago, you know, didn't we see Shredder in the 
TMNT movies. <laughs> yeah, and he looked like the Shredder, and that worked. And came off imposing no matter, even if you did find it looked to be weird looking or, oh gosh, this is cartoony. You know, if anything, look at the turtles themselves. There were guys in rubber suits with little animatic puppet faces. Yeah, they they were kind of goofy and cartoony, but guess what? They were the turtles. Each of their personalities were pretty much right there. All right, give, look at that. We got we oh uh oh we got we got on the comment section we got you know basically Deanna and Kyle basically sharing how you know it's true there's no love for. Her. Cal Rainier, as my friend would say, you know it's Rainer. But, uh, yeah. It it is it is kind of a true fact, and I'm really hoping. And that was one thing about Greenland the animated series that kind of really irked me. It's like they introduced Guy, a character that we've already been introduced to. It's like the mop top. there you go. <laughs> yeah yeah you know good old mop top. Yeah you know the warrior, the guy who apparently owns a bar and grill in the DC universe. Hey, is this just me or the green? No, was it no? It was when he was in um the um Brave and the Bold. Did it mean that his normal face looked like he was sedated? I mean, uh, I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm <laughs> I'm sorry, but I I just looked at that and I'm like, okay, you had Guy Garner for Brave and the Bold. I'm like, huh? Could you use Kyle? I look at, you know, Green Lantern, the animated series, and I'm like, okay, so instead we go, you know, no Kyle yet again, because I guess he'd have to be designed to look similar to Hal, and that's why they didn't want to use him. So instead, what do we get? Oh, we get Guy Garner, or as I called him in that series, Buzz Lightyear, because he did look like fucking Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> to oh. infinity and beyond. <laughs> Yeah, I was waiting for him to have a jetpack and go to infinity and beyond. It's like, man, nobody loves Kyle. The only love that Kyle ever got was in Superman the Animated Series. And even then they copied Hal Jordan's like origin because of the whole like Emerald Twilight stuff. But, I'm but, like, but, man. Uh, but Deanna just brought up a good point. You know, but they for some reason always, always mention Jon Stewart even if he's not in it. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and I can see, and so many people are like, you know, the Justice League cartoons were great. It was cool that John was introduced, but now they're just using him as like the racial excuse, you know. Oh, you know, oh, because he's the only Black Lantern that's within the group. It's like you know, I don't like the race card deal, but I can partly see that point. But here's the thing: there are four Human Lanterns. There's Hal. There's Guy, there's John, and there's Kyle. So basically, what? Kyle's the nerd, and he's not allowed into the boys' club. And hey, what about Alan Scott? <laughs> Alan Scott. Well, I'm talking about the Green Lantern Corps, Malcolm. I'm not talking about the Green Lanterns overall. No, now, if you want to get now, now, if you want to get technical, look at Now, if you now, if you want to get technical, yeah, Alan Scott fits into that. Even though the Star Heart is a cosmic entity, not a Green Lantern Corps power ring. Steve, you know, a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds ago, were you that itchy? I mean, he was like, <sighs> you know, "Oh, sorry, I'm yeah." No. About, I'm talking about John Stewart. I'm, 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 I'm scared that he might come and attack me. Oh no, sorry. No, I've, I've, I've been like. I was bit by a couple of mosquitoes today while I was at work. So I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm a little itchy right now. Trying not to scratch too much. Scratch. Scratch. <laughs> yeah, not yeah, not not trying to do like Triple H and his atomic dump punches. <laughs> oh gosh, that was Green Lantern's power ring. Where'd that come from? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're getting way, way off topic. Oh, but there, now. Is, there is, there is, there is one movie that we that me and Chris saw a trailer for not a couple of months ago. I know, and um, and um, it's featuring Denzel Washington and Mark Wahlberg, and it's called Two Guns. I actually want to see that. I know. I think one movie that. I'm sure a lot of people may not. I don't even know. I think it comes out next year, but it's like that 
now you see me where it's like Morgan Freeman's part of like a of Yeah, that's really piquing my interest. I'm like, you know, I actually want to see what this movie's about cuz I'm trying to really decipher are uh, is um Woody Harrelson his gang the villains or they just are uh, and you got um freaking Mark Ruffalo looking all scruffy. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, it, you got all this. Yeah, you got all that stuff. Pretty much, you know, happening. I mean, there's just there's a lot really going on, and I think one of the big points that a lot of people are talking about, and it's been not so much worldwide, but it's just been talked about as you know, going back to Man of Steel a little bit. You know, I, I'm kind of a little bit fearful for the movie, not just because it's a Superman movie, but I'm fearful because this is where Warner Bros. wants to put all their eggs in one basket, Malcolm. If this movie succeeds, which I more than likely see that it might, this is going to be the jumping point for how they're going to do a JLA movie. And that that's a that's what really kind of you know concerns me, because I'm like, okay, you want to jump Justice League off of this, which I have no problem with, but their alleged plans that they want to do Superman, then Batman, then straight do Justice League. No World's Finest. If they did World's Finest, I would have been okay with that. But they just, right after the Batman reboot, they want to just all of a sudden do Justice League and then do spinoff movies for Wonder Woman, Flash, and all them. And as much as I get that Warner Brothers doesn't want to copy the Marvel method of movies, I don't see that working out very well because, A, you'd have to cram as much backstory as you could in two hours, along with following the plot of them all getting together and teaming up. And then to do the spin-off movies afterwards, that's pretty much like studio suicide. And it's like I was talking about with, you know, a couple of other people, not only not only on Xbox, but through like Skype and stuff. More or less, Malcolm, this is basically Warner Brothers is trying really hard to just drive DC to bankruptcy and just completely kill them altogether. Which that that saddens me because it's like so Warner Brothers basically just wants to kill the entire DC universe cinematically so that we can never get any movies for any other DC characters if Justice League fails. That that's a very scary thought to me. So, what I was just saying is that Warner Brothers is standing by, it, it, it's standing by the medical bed of DC, and they just got their hand on the plug. Yeah, that's basically what it feels like, cinematic wise, not comic wise. Like, and as each year go by, they they. They jerk, get your mind, get your get your mind out of the gutter, people. They jerk the wire, and keep jerking, and then when finally when they're done, you know. You know, but I mean, it, it's a very big gamble, Malcolm. I mean, to do a Justice League movie after Superman and Batman, then introduce all the other characters. Although I understand Warner Brothers' reasoning why, you know, because you got the world's finest as like you know the two big selling points for them out of DC but here's the problem to make a Justice League movie successful you kinda have to follow the Marvel method in my opinion because if you don't set up Aquaman if you don't set up Martian Manhunter if you don't set up Flash or Wonder Woman and people the casual general audience go in there and you have to try to explain within the first half of the half of the movie where these characters come from, their powers, all that shit. Then the second half is the entire damn purpose of the movie as a whole. That really isn't going to work. It really isn't. And even if you blended it, it's not going to work. Now, case in point, look at it, you know, going back to the Marvel method. What did they do? They set it up with Iron Man. They stopped it with Captain America. Then they went straight to Avengers. And that actually worked out naturally because then you already knew the characters, you knew who they were, what they were about, all that stuff. So when Avengers came into frame, Malcolm, when it came to fruition, you already, the characters were already established. You just had to find a threat to bring them together. 
that's all and that's all Avengers really was. It was the culmination of all the films finally coming full circle. If Warner if Warner Brothers actually stopped worrying about their fat catism and actually did the same method, no matter if people called it copycatting or not, then they would come full circle and it would be a financial boom for them. And you know, and even Kevin Feige, the he, the lead producer on all these Marvel movies, he honestly wants DC to have a successful Justice League movie. Yeah, and even, but um, Deanna, you know, just said that you know, yeah, you know, Warner Brothers, they can get their sh together. They they should step away from doing DC movies. They should. Because if that's their only financial cash cow right now, Malcolm, I'm sorry, that, uh, that's like a blind man trying to chase a donut down a hill in a stone wheel, and there's no highway. Yeah, that, that's like, that's like, um, that's like you trying to get rid of that five o'clock shadow. You know, it, it it's just like trying to condense your head your head down so it can actually fit in the frame. Hey, it's doing that right now, isn't it? Yeah, okay, I'll admit that. Yeah, I, I, yeah. And, and with that, I think that would be a good way of somehow segueing into the yeah, next Yeah, well, let's, just, let's just segue into the next one before I try to do another lame joke. Which is... <laughs> When you take out movies that we're looking forward to 2013, we will insert video games that we're looking forward to of 2013, which for me is only a handful. Yeah, there's maybe only one or two, honestly, that I'm looking forward to. <coughs> <clears throat> yeah, man. I'm... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, like, hmm. Okay, okay, I, okay, I'll give you one. Okay, right off the bat, um, right off the bat, in August, Saints Row 4. Now, the Saints Row series started off as just one point that people to may thought was going to be your, a carbon copy of Grand Theft Auto, and now it's turned into being something, their own identity. And now, it's all over the place. Your character, after the events of Saints Row 3, is going to become the president. And it's an alien invasion. So we go from gang warfare to a president going against aliens. <laughs> and let's not and let's not forget we'll still be taking out old ladies with septic trucks, giant bunnies appearing out of the ocean like Godzilla, and beating people to death with dildos. <laughs> oh, oh, oh wait, oh wait, but let's not forget about, you know, Saints Row you know, Saints Row 2 where you robbed a bank with giant Johnny heads and one of the people being robbed actually asked for your autograph. Wait, that was Saints Row 3. Was it really 3? Yep, because in 2, you know, basically the whole thing with you and Gat was avenging Aisha's death. Ow. Ow. Oh, see, uh, th that's how much I really know about the Saints Row games. <laughs> And then let's not forget that your character also literally flew through a plane, did not bang into one piece of dill, and literally shot up everybody as he flew through the plane. I'm like, I'm like, okay, that yeah, was awesome. Yeah, that was the that was... shoot 'em up inspired scene. I'm, I'm, I'm like, okay, that's cool, but that's bullshit. <laughs> I'm trying to say that was too over the top. That. Um, Part of me wants to say yes. Part of me just wants to say to really say who cares. That was awesome. But I, I think I think for me, and I probably will have to get an upgraded PS3 because I got the Netflix Station 3 right now, mm -hmm. as it's That's been dubbed. Good. You know, because my PS3 currently doesn't read discs. But I think, but you know, the reason why I bring PS3 into it is because I think one game that really intrigues me, and I was watching gameplay of it. And I kind of the actually like, us. yeah, The Last of Us. Because, mm -hmm. like, a lot of people are saying, oh, it's your stereotypical zombie deal. Not really. Because I actually looked up what is afflicting, you know, the people, and it's actually a fungus that eats insects from, from the inside out. And I like the concept 
that the developers were talking about. What if this thing, ju you know, jumped the species and went to humans? How would it affect humans? Like, you know, how would it mutate them? And I thought, okay, I like that. But what I also like is kind of in a Walking Dead a la style, you're also facing frantic survivors, like, right. you know, like depraved survivors. And you got this girl. And what I like about, you know, the girl in that is the fact that she was in like a quarantine zone. She was in a zone where there was literally nothing was allowed. So she's never seen the outside world. She's never done any of this. And then you got the guy, I think his name is John, who's, he's been a survivor. He's been scavenging, you know, throughout the world. And it's like one developer put it, when you look at the world, Malcolm, you see nature overtaking. You see vegetation growing all over, like, build, condemned buildings and stuff. And it gives kind of like this very serenely peaceful but really, like, you know, uneasy, like, okay, what's going to happen here kind of vibe. And I kind of like that because... You can you can kind of be amazed with the environment, but you also have to be okay. You know, is there going to be a zombie around the corner? Is there going to be like you know a gang of survivors trying to siphon fuel? They're going to try to kill me for food. Like it really gives you that that like you know eerie vibe of that un, that on edge feel. You know, you're yeah, on the basically basically you know the on edge like you know adrenaline pumping like feeling. Yeah, no. Um. Yeah. If I if I had a if you know if I had a if me and Chris had a PS3, I I can I can totally say that that would be one game that we would buy. Um. But um. Unfortunately, we don't. And um. But um. One game that I'm looking forward to. A, you know, it's a yearly thing. Uh. And I know it's one of Steve's favorites too. You know. And that's because it's going to be the 25th, 25th anniversary of Madden football. Oh, man. Steve, I know, boy, you are pumped up to pump up the 25th anniversary of Madden. Oh, boy. Get those ding-dongs and corn dogs ready. I'm going to choke slam you. You can't, you can't do that. Your, your hands are too greasy with all the chips and munchies. <clears throat> No, I think I think another game that I'm actually looking forward to, and yeah, it's a cheesy choice. Matter of fact, I actually have a pre-ordered right now. Is you know the Deadpool game, right? You know, it, it's like it's like yes, the Merc with the Mouth finally will get his own video, his own solo video game, and that, and it looks to be shaping up to be pretty decent. I mean, you got Mister Sinister, you got the Acolytes, you or got the Marauders, bouncy. bouncy. Yeah, you got like, you know, Psylocke, you got Death, you got Cable. You know, you actually get into a boss fight with Wolverine. It's like, Cause... yeah, this is... Bang, bang. Bang, bang. Bang, bang. Yeah, you know, de yeah, Deadpool's going to be, you know, doing his stereotypical bang, bang, you know, shenanigans. Oh. But I mean... Trying to think, what were some other games? I brought up, brought up too, and I agree with him. Batman Arkham Origins. Batman Arkham Origins is definitely a must. And he said maybe, but for me, I, I have to put GTA for me. So you trying to tell me? John, you trying to tell me how to be a, a bad, good enough gangbanger? Yes. That's that's heritage. That's all we got. I thought he was getting out of this bullshit. And when you hear Chris in the background commentating. Oh, yeah. I don't get see, You know, Chris, when it comes to trailers, <laughs> you don't even have to listen to the trailers. Just let Chris do it all. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I'm going to get Steve. Chris, we know that you we know that you watched this a thousand times. You don't have to, you don't have to repeat the lines. <laughs> Trying to think, where were some? Oh yeah, I'm trying. I think it comes out towards the end of this year, doesn't it? Remember me. That's what Chris just mentioned. Remember me. I was greatly intrigued by that. Well, Steve, and something else that you're intrigued by: Call of Duty Ghosts. Don't remind me. I had coworkers looking at that. <laughs> 
Whether you love it or not, Call of Duty is always gonna go is gonna garner a reaction. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those type of games, Steve. <laughs> but also, I'm gonna have the first I technically don't count two K thirteen. I mean I don't I mean I don't count um, the last installment as its first. We're gonna have our real first WWE game in the two K era. Yeah. Fourteen. See how that play out. I, I I feel that WWE is in good hands. Hey, I'm looking forward to seeing what WWE fourteen is going to be like. Yeah, with the the success of games like NBA, the NBA two K series, and the you know you know it used to be the NFL two K series. I don't think a lot can go wrong. With WWE being part of 2K for being part of 2K Sports. No, the only complaint that I really have is that they had to re-release WWE 13 under the 2K label. I found that to yeah. be a very stupid move. I felt that was I felt that was very stupid, and I felt you know I understand. Okay, like I don't know if it was out of desperate. You guys couldn't wait, but it's like technically. Technically, even if you do consider it under 2K Sports, we still know that's not 2K Sports graphics. That's graphics from THQ and everybody. So it really made no sense. Basically, to me, I looked at it as a spit in the face. I'm now fuck you, get over. Yeah, you could look at it like that, too. And it's funny because since we're going on 50 minutes, we're going on 50 minutes is the perfect way to segue into the topic that me and Steve was always, always um, you know, talking about, discussing about, and that's wrestlers that have been built up, but when they were debuted, they were either underutilized or, oh, yeah, just underutilized. <laughs> oh, yeah, let, let's not forget, you know, let's not also forget about the fact of, you know, wrestlers that potentially should come back as well. Right. You know, like, case in point, there have been uh, there have been many wrestlers, like you and I were talking about last night or the night before last, that got hyped up, but they didn't really do anything with them. You know, case in point, Ultimo Dragon. They, man, did they hype him up, and it's like, this dude could have been, you know, anybody who has been a WCW fan knows of Ultimo Dragon in the Cruiserweight division. That dude, you know, dude was great to watch. And and I got and I was genuinely excited when I saw him come to WWE. I'm like, "Okay, this is a good natural transition for Dragon and, you know, get a rivalry with, you know, Ray going." Yeah, and yeah, man, he, he had, renew his rivalry with Ray. He had a banging theme. An he had a great entrance, and he had an awesome finishing move that, like you know, that like you know, backflip reverse DDT. Yeah, and, and he wasn't even close. He one time beat. I remember him beating Ray, and I remember the Thunder's match for the Cruiserweight title. And I have a recall, he finally got his shot months later in a multi-man match, and I was thinking, wait a minute. They don't want to drag him. You had number contenders match. Then that was going to be one on one. Why is everybody else in his title match? And to make it even worse, afterwards they just dropped him off. He never won a championship or anything. No. Nope. And that and and that's what really I'm like. Okay, we've seen Ultimo Dragon with championships. This dude has. Done, like dozens of international championships. I think at one time they had a picture of him, Malcolm. He had like With 10, 10 or 12 titles. belts. He had 10 titles all at once. Yeah. 10 freaking belts. That should tell you how legit he is. That's right. This guy is a legend in New Japan. And that's the thing. It's going to show you that. The, the Vince and company, it seemed like they didn't want to digest pushing their non-homegrown talent. 
and a, you know, and a second guy. And looking back at it, he had all the right tools. He was bit. He was he was a powerhouse, but he was also quick on his feet. He was very charismatic. He had all the right tools, and that was Sean O'Hare. Right. He had all the right tools in place. He had a he had a cool entrance theme. His Titan Tron was a little bit creepy, you know. And his promos were actually pretty interesting. And okay, the Widowmaker, that like reverse like slam that he that he always used to do. Yeah, shades of know, that, Yeah, and and I'll tell and this guy even for a big dude he could even do a Swanton bomb. The guy, the guy, Sean O'Hare, when I first saw Sean O'Hare, I first saw him in WCW, back when he had the short, spiky hair, and he was teaming up with Chuck Palumbo, and I was really intrigued about his work ethic. I was like, man, for a big guy, you know, he's very quick on his feet, you know, he's very fluent, and next thing you know, and he, I believe he actually went on to win Rookie of the Year, of uh, the year he debuted, and... I couldn't blame, you know, them for picking him as rookie of the year, I think, what, 99 or 2000? And, yeah, it was, Sean O'Hare was very talented. Um, somebody, um, I just didn't understand kind of the the pairing of him and Roddy Piper. I just didn't understand that too much. No, I, I didn't understand that as well. And what I really, and what I really didn't like is that Roddy Piper just felt like he was just there. That was it. And I'm like, and I'm like, okay, I get they're supposed to play the mentor role, but um, considering the gimmick that O'Hare had, Piper felt really inappropriate. Like, a, like to me, somebody that was just as psychological as O'Hare's gimmick came across as, that should have been somebody that they should have paired him with. Like, you know, somebody along the lines. Of maybe you know like Ric Flair or like somebody like Paul Bear or something like a character oh, that was oh, I very. Know else. I know who else. If they got a chance, they could have got James Mitchell before James Mitchell went on to 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 manage Abyss. Yeah, there you go. But you know, I can like, understand because when Piper used to talk for with, with Sean O'Hare, it wasn't as the case. Is most times you see managers, they'll actually. They actually speak for their wrestler. What what they actually would speak on the perspective of the the wrestler they're managing. But with Roddy Piper, when he cut his promo with Sean O'Hare, he was just cutting his, basically his own promo. It's like, okay, what does the technically have to do with Sean O'Hare? Now Piper, his his return to WWE was very shocking. He returned in the Hogan Vince McMahon match and clocked Hogan with the pipe and everything. That shocked everybody. Like, oh shoot, Piper. And but everything else then fall into place for Piper. And to be honest, after that, his 2003 run in WWE is kind of basically forgotten. Yeah, it's like you know I hate to say it, but Hot Rod really didn't have anything all that memorable. The most memorable thing was how on Piper's pity got stunned by Austin. <laughs> um, him. Somebody else. That you know was you know hyped up with vignettes, and so making making it seem as though this person was going to be a big deal. And, oh oh, what well, is a tag team? Even though you know in a way the you know the the kind of the the gimmick was you want to say for in WWE's case kind of a little bit racist or stereo not racist but stereotypical. Crime time. They did all these vignettes for crime time. I'm thinking, okay, we got the next big tag team coming. They got super over with the fans. And every time they got number one contenders match, they always said, oh, crime time, number one, they had a number one contenders match. You know, they got their number one contender. I'm like, okay, where's the number one contenders match? And I come to find out, oh, they were at house shows. Oh, big whoop. You <laughs> know, and, 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 and then I think what made it sad was, was that okay? They broke up the tag team, and that would have been a great rivalry for JTG and Shad. They did nothing with Shad. They did nothing with him, and then JTG they absolutely did shit all with him. And now yeah, I think it, they just let him go. Yeah, they basically when in 2010, when Crime Time you know dissolved, one 
one, there was really no, it was really shocking because there was no build up to, you know, seeing them, you know, you know, having animosity towards each other. And I remember they lost a match to the Hart Foundation. I believe the Hart Foundation, they lost a match to John Morrison, R Truth, who was a team at the time. And next thing you know, you see JTG upset. I'm thinking JTG's going to be the one to turn on Shad. Next thing you know, Shad's the one to turn on him. And then, you know, he cuts his promo how, you know, uh, no more crime time. It's my time. And he gets repackaged, gets, you know, he starts wearing briefs and, like, shorts now. And they do a match with him and JTG at Extreme Rules in a strap match. And to be honest, I, you know, at the time I was happy for JTG to get the win, but at the same time, I had to agree with one person. I was like, wait a minute. If J, if this was, if Shad's would win, I got repackaged. Why they didn't go with Shad winning? And I was like, yeah, that kind of was kind of weird. But then nothing happened with Shad. You know, he had a promo where he cut, he came out with this blue suit. Next thing you know, I'm like, hey, what happened to Shad? When he was like repackaged, like the next top upper mid card heel for SmackDown, and then JTG was just a not even a jobber to the stars. He was just a jobber. <laughs> yeah, that. Let's see, another guy that you know. I th I think I think a big big one, and even you'll and even you'll agree with me, Malcolm. They did him really dirty. Although from what I heard from backstage politics, he really didn't want to play or get along all that well. But you know, the Colossus of Baga Road, Nathan Jones. They hyped him up to be like the next Stone Cold Steve Austin. And he did nothing. He didn't even get to participate in his tag match at WrestleMania. He came at the end, right. and then he was part of. And then he was part of like you know Brock's team. I'm like, this makes no sense. Yeah, he like disappeared, and then came back with Brock's team. And you know, with Nathan Jones, I've heard a lot of things for Nathan Jones. One, I know, I remember on a podcast, he actually was done just with wrestling at all because when it came to Ken realize that to be honest, he felt that he was not that good at his work. And to him he felt if I'm not that good, you know, I shouldn't be in the industry. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, he was the best because, you know, he did have a lot of botches and stuff, but if that was the case, then hey, it just shows that, hey, now all the time, you know, wrestling business cuts out well for everybody. But Nathan Jones was another one, you know. Yeah, I liked his vignettes. He had that nice, that nice menacing theme that had that Australian, you know, feel to it. But um, who else? I'm trying to think of some else that was built up, and you know, they basically, um, um, 2005. And it was also the case of because they actually got over whether you liked it or not. To be honest. Carlito, in a way, Carlito, like it or not, actually got over with the fans. You know, that whole spin in people's face, I'm not going to lie. That thing got so over where, unfortunately, when I was in elementary school at the time, there were people actually trying to take Apple and trying to spit in people's faces. That's how over that thing, unfortunately, got. The sp I spin in the face with people that, that don't, that don't want to be cool. I was like, wow, the thing actually got over. And, you know, I think... I think in many cases, you know, we talked about it, you know, one that was really horrible. I mean, they did vignettes for him, and it really didn't work out, and I'm kind of glad that it didn't, was Kazarni. I mean, when I saw those vignettes, I'm like, I'm like, nah, I'm, li I'm like, I can't take this dude seriously. It's like, I can take Paul Burchill's, like, you know, pirate gimmick more seriously. No, oh, he's now, he's Kazarni. <laughs> doing that carny so-called talk. I'm like, nah, I, I, I couldn't take this guy seriously. One team that I felt was really done dirty, but it was within legit reasons since they caught them at like TNA shows and all this oh, stuff, but boy, the Highlanders. Like, uh, like I actually like that team. They were like the new Bushwhackers. Yeah, they was, and they actually, I didn't mind them, but one thing that made no sense in my opinion was when they turned them heels. I did not understand that. I'm like, oh, so they are supposed to be your stereotypical bad, bad, scruffy Scottishman. Yeah. 
like that that to me didn't really like were that to me just didn't work another guy that kind of got done dirty he got hyped up and then you know he did pretty good for a while but then they just kind of basically like you know like you know just let him slack off after a while and even he got a little bit fat was MVP yeah MVP from from September 2006 they start doing these stuff oh you know so and take long at some so called press conference and he's shaking hands with this black guy with dreads. I'm like, who is this guy? Who is this MVP guy? And why why is he, you know, getting front row tickets and you know, he's with girls? I'm like, is this guy supposed to be a wrestler? He's supposed to be like a a, a new authority figure. The next thing you know, you come to find he's actually a wrestler and he has a he has his debut match at No More Trust against uh, Marty Marty Grainer or Garner a, a a lifetime jobber, and I'm thinking, okay, there's really nothing special about this MVP guy. He looks like a freaking a human size, looks like a human inside inside a Bud Light can, and you know he starts getting chance. Power Ranger, Power Ranger. I'm like, man. Next thing you know, he gets in a few with Kane, and I'm like, man. There, I'm thinking back the time. I'm thinking, you know, before I knew about all this stuff in the back, I'm like. I'm thinking, man, this man, they, um, this guy's sure in a lot of high-profile stuff. You know, he's in with Kane. He's in an infernal match, a street fight, a cage match with Kane. That's a big deal. That's a real big deal. Next thing you know, he finally gets a real. He finally gets a title match with Benoit, and that's where I became a believer. And I'm like, oh, this guy's pretty something. He went on to go hold the United States title for a year. And you know he lost it to Matt, and then once he lost the Matt, the losses just kept piling up. And the why, and why the losses piled up, Steve, the weight piled up. And it's so funny because as you and Chris once made the comment, Black is supposed to compliment somebody who apparently has like a gut. On MVP, you could see the outline of his gut. Yeah, you can see the outline of his gut and where the love handle and everything. It just reminds me of when, when Triple H got fat. And I'm not going to lie, I always laugh at it. Is he's in a Hell in a Cell match with the, the famous Hell in a Cell match with Shawn Michaels that went over, for 40, went over 45 minutes. When Triple H comes out, and you know Triple H, the lights are always black. In the silhouette, you can see his loved hand. I'm like, oh my God, this guy is fat now. You can see the love handles of his silhouette. Like, hey, hey, did Triple H get ass onto his gear? Yeah, love handles. <laughs> No, I think trying to. No, I think I think you know. Case in point, one guy that it's so funny they tried to repackage him, and it was an ECW promo. You know, was Shannon Moore? They tried to give him the faux hawk, and and like you know, and like you know, the grungy, like you know, yeah, rebellious rocker kind of deal when they were doing WWE ECW. I'm like, I'm like, okay. We know who Shannon Moore is. We've seen him. He was the follower for Matt Hardy. This dude does not need to be getting his own promos. Yeah, you know, it makes me wonder. I like what somebody said. If you're going to do these vignettes and so, and, uh, it, no, what the guy said, oh, it makes it, I always find it funny how WWE brings in some of these people with vignettes and stuff, but yet they, they come out and say that they didn't know what to do with them. Then why did you bring them in? And why did you bring them in as if they were going to be special? It's not like as though, you know, the crowd was into the gimmick or so. You just actually go say, oh, we didn't know what to do with them. Case in point, awesome calm. When after, you know, she had, you know, she, she got pregnant and unfortunately she, she didn't have her baby, which was unfortunate. She, she got back in ring shape and she was just waiting for calls and actually calling them and saying, okay, you know, I'm ready to return, but they just kept saying, "We have, we don't, we have nothing planned for you." It's like really that same thing they did for Caval. Caval went up to head court, asked, or if or got or a low key Caval, you know, Senshi. You know, he said, you know, he went up to and said, you know, you guys have got anything planned for me after you know, you know, I lost the the, uh, the Intercontinental Title match to Dolph Ziggler. No, 
You took that as saying, okay, they're not going to have anything planned for me. Now, I know one person say he maybe could have just waited out a little longer, but come on now. You saying you have nothing. You have nothing. Not even, not even a snippet of an idea. You just have nothing planned for him after you haven't win NXT 2. That's going to make the person feel like, then why did you guys have me win then? Wow. Exactly. And, and you know, I, I think, you know, another case in point, and I feel bad for her because, you, know, I, I, you know, I do adore the girl. I think she's not only a great wrestler, but it's just I like her personality overall. Caitlin, look, I mean, look at her. They built her up to be like, you know, Beth Phoenix 2.0, and look at her now. She's losing matches to the Bellas, and she's a champion. She is the women's champion. Thank you, Steve, for not calling it Divas Champion. I'm sorry. I still call it women's. So I think that you said women's. Yeah, you got Caitlyn, who is tagged with the nickname um, the, the the hybrid of power and beauty, which is a which is a good enough nickname to, you know, you know, a good enough nickname to, you know, put on the marquee or so. And she's the champ, but yet She's losing matches to the Bellas, who for I still don't understand the reason why WWE is so high on them. And I have to agree with my friend Nate. I think they're doing some political stuff, or they may be, or they may be, unfortunately, you know, my friend Nate said that he's seen pictures with them with Cena. Um, yeah, um, I hope that wasn't just a buddy buddy pictures. Maybe they're, you, maybe they're doing something political in their way to the top or something. Because they just went mad. But, but, but what I'm trying to say is, it's not that it's not that they beat they beat Kalen. They don't even beat Kalen with underhanded tactics. They don't even get offense out of it's like you would think the Bellas being smaller frame heels and they're going against and they're not that good in the ring, I might add. And they're going against Kalen supposed to be supposed to be built up as a powerhouse. Wouldn't you think that the match would play out as you see a lot of eye rakes and a lot of eye um eye poking and you know, rope choking from the buzz to get the underhanded, the cut off Kalen. No, you're not getting that at all. Kalen's just being grounded with clean moves. I'm like, wait a minute. This just seems totally wrong. This seems yeah. wrong. You know, I you know, I I think I think one I think one guy, although it's understandable because of his gimmick, Muhammad Hassan. I looking back on it. You know, yeah, I think the gimmick itself was very risky. It probably shouldn't have been done. But at the same time, I didn't mind, you know, the guy, you know, the guy when he was wrestling. I thought he was, you know, a pretty decent worker. His gimmick was pretty well and even though he's annoying as shit and he was snot-nosed, I didn't mind Davari being like, you know, his henchman. And one thing, like, mom and our sons, his words his words, even though you know he was a heel and all, you, there was some truth behind some stuff he was saying. You know how you know I never gonna forget when um when um he had the the Taliban guys looking looking guys attack Undertaker the first time, and and he basically said in the newspaper that said you know uh, Iranian guys attack Undertaker and he said how did you how did, how could you know dude, they were Iranian when they were wearing masks? I'm like. He does got a point. He does got a point. They could have been Americans for all we know, just under masks, looking like, you know, the Taliban or so. But yes, Steve, to your point, you're right. It was just a case of um, gimmick rise just at the wrong time. Because. I, I, and, and, you know, I've always looked at it this way, Malcolm. I understood what Vince was doing with this guy's gimmick, but even the guy himself. You know, the guy, you know, with the Muhammad Hassan gimmick, even he admitted that that's part of the reason that he just stopped. You know, he basically said, you know, I want out of my contract because I have people legitimately sending me death threats. He actually would have people coming at him with, like, knives and stuff. Well, and, it's like, it, and, and, and it's the case of, you know, it's those wrestling fans that they can't discern that, hey, this guy's got a gimmick. He's playing a character. Whereas those of us who are, quote-unquote, smart marks, as the business calls it, 
we think, okay, I don't like this guy's gimmick, but that's just, you know, the way that they're building the character up. You know, I'm sure outside of it, he's not a bad guy. And the funny part is, the guy's Italian, yet he played an yeah. Arabic character. That's what made that funny. That's how it is most of the point with the, the foreign heels. And then, I'm not going to say that. Look, for instance, if you somebody say, oh, you mean by foreign heels, you mean because the person's not from the United States? I'm like, no. Because Christian was a heel. That didn't make him a foreign. A foreign heel is somebody that has anti-American views. That's what you could label as a foreign. That's what Mama Nassan was. So, but in a different way. But, yeah, most of them, look at Yokozuna. Yokozuna wasn't Japanese. And he was Samoan. He was Samoan. <laughs> he was Samoan. Yeah. I believe, I, I believe um, Nikita Koloff. I don't think Nikita Koloff is, is of Russian descent. But he played the character so well that people thought that, yeah, he actually was Russian. And, you know, I mean, it, it's just one of those... I mean, Baron Von Rushke, you know, legend, he wasn't German. He was from Idaho. <laughs> Potatoes. <laughs> exactly. He, he was a country guy, and he was playing a German character. Yeah. So that, but, you know, but the Mohammed Hassan case, but then again... You know, it's one of those deals of who could have saw this coming? Who would have? Who could have saw that the bomb, those bombings in London, was going to happen exactly around the time Muhammad Hassan's character was getting to a high point, and on the same week of the show, we could have never saw that coming. And plus, it was too late. Cause it was on a SmackDown taping when he had those Taliban guys come and. Um, and that's basically what kind of caused UPN to say you gotta take his character off the off the um, network because you know we're getting flat we're getting flat for you know for airing that on the same night the London bombing happened and I'm gonna get SmackDown's tape so if it happened it ha really happened on Tuesday but it was aired on Thursday which was the same day of the bombing so that was a case of you know really WWE. They couldn't look in the future and knew that was going to happen. So basically, it was by the time it happened, it was too late, and they basically had to do what was best, and they, they basically had to pull the plug on the Mama Nassan character. But somebody else that um that um but built up, you know, he's in the WWE today, but built up vignette, and next thing they pulled a 180, Brodus Clay. Man, I was looking forward to his vignettes as a monster heel. You know, actually getting creepy down. You know, I don't care. I don't care if he has a mother. I don't care if he has a girlfriend. I don't care about that. I'm thinking, oh, this is some. This is some good heel monster heel stuff. You know, really come off intimidating. Next thing you know, they hold off his debut, and then he comes back, and he's this funker. So I'm thinking, so when did he get this? This personality change all of a sudden. Now all of a sudden he's all happy go lucky in a matter of weeks. Yeah, he he's now basically flash funks like, you know, fat cousin. Yeah, I'm like, wait a minute. So John told me that he was being built up as a monster heel. <laughs> Bless you. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, after weeks of his after weeks of just waiting and waiting, he maybe just decides, I don't want to be, you know, a cold, heartless guy anymore. You know, it's not even. I'm not even. I'm gonna come back, and I'm still cool, but I'm gonna make a. I'm gonna be solely in transition, becoming happy go lucky. No, I'm just happy go lucky. Here I am. But you know what, though, I think, I I think you know another guy, and it's kind of sad because I would have thought WWE for like the fifth time would have done something with them, and that. Is you know Matt Bloom, also known as Albert or Prince Albert, A Train, and now Sweet T or Tensai, and I feel bad, and I really do. I feel bad for Matt Bloom because you it's like the video. I'm talking about right when I said you know it looks like you know he doesn't he doesn't love what he's doing, and he kept saying, "What do you mean?" Then all of a sudden he was like, oh, "I see what you're talking about." <laughs> yeah, like like you know it, and it's kind of sad, really, because it's like. You look at Matt Bloom in the ring. I've watched some of his New Japan stuff when he was known as the Great Bernard, and I got to admit, Malcolm, I'm like, okay, this guy had an IC title reign. He goes over to Japan to get his skills. When he was Tensai, 
this guy should have got another Intercontinental Tyler, or even a United States title shot. Hell, this guy should have been at least built up to be in the running for like the WWE or World Heavyweight Championship. Cause yep. I kind of like, cause I kind of liked the vignettes, and then I, when he came out, I didn't know who he was. And you know, I'm, I, you know, I see the guard and everything like that, and I'm like, okay, this is a big dude. You know, maybe this will be, you know, like the next Yokozuna. Sure enough, he pulls off the cowl and everything. I see all the you know, all the, the KG writing and everything, and I'm like, oh, shoot, they brought back, you know, Matt Bloom and, like, a new gimmick. And I liked, you know, that poison, you know, the poison, like, you know, claw fist, you know, hold STO. I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, ooh, you know, I like seeing that. You know, he's doing running sentons and stuff like that. Now it's just like, man, it's like WWE, you know, keeps using this guy, and they don't do anything with him half the time. They had him beat John Cena. They had him pin CM Punk, who was the champ at the time. And I remember when somebody actually called it. Somebody said, in a matter of months, Watch Tense, I was just going to be, he's going to be that big guy that everybody beats. A couple of months later, boy, was that, that, that guy right. That's all he became. He just became that big, intimidating guy. Who kept losing his intimidation, pro, intimidation um, flair? He, he got beat in a, in a. He basically got squashed by Kofi Kingston. Let me repeat that for those of you who are wrestling fans. He got squashed. Big old Tensai, big old Matt Bloom, got squashed by Kofi Kingston. And, and nothing a, against Kofi. Nothing against Kofi, but look at Kofi and you look at. Ten style, Matt Bloom. And, and 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 within a minute, Malcolm, what happened? Knocked he you know, did the control, Yeah, he, he did the controlled frenzy, did the boom drop, and then trouble in paradise and within like a minute, minute and a half. And then to make matters worse, this was during the Slammy Awards. Here comes Santino, and then here comes Tensai. As you and I always laugh, here comes Tensai Malcolm with that giant like ice pack like tied to his head. And he just looked like he came out of like a Looney Tunes skit. He looks like one of the Looney Tunes characters <laughs> after he got an anvil dropped on him. Don't forget, when he came out, he slipped too. To make you <laughs> matter, he slipped when he came through the curtains. <laughs> <laughs> and now, you know, he's with Brodus Clay, and I have and I have to question, you know, when it's like okay, after doing this tag team shtick. Cause like I, I really got to question that. It's like you know, if if he doesn't and my like, thing he is, doesn't like that, he's doing a good job hiding that he doesn't like it. <laughs> you know, well I can imagine he's probably teamed with Brodus because he thinks, hey, maybe I'll get an extra tag team championship run. Which you know what, which you know what, I think Brodus and Tensai should actually get like the, a tag team title shot at the very least. Because it seems like as of late, they've been kind of on a roll. Yeah, just like the Usos have. Exactly. You know, and, and there you go. There's a tag team that really should have gotten their shot a lot longer ago. Yeah, they, they debuted by feuding with the Hart found the Hart Dynasty while the Hart Dynasty were champs. And, okay. and that's another one. That was another team. It's like... It's like, man, you had the son of the British Bulldog, you had Tyson Kidd, the last to be trained in the dungeon before it got shut down, and then you got Natalia, the daughter of Jim the Anvil Nyhart. Man, they should have been a lot more over because of their lineage. But sadly, they really didn't. Natalia got a farting gimmick. Now she's the you know the the backstage interviewer on on Saturday morning slam DH Smith just kind of like left Tyson Kidd's injured yeah, don't it's like well don't forget Natalia uh, is is now the clinger of of Kali's arm yeah let's not forget about that she's part of the so-called odd you know oddity or odd couple pairing uh, but yeah there's just there's just been so many wrestlers you know that you know that have been built up with vignettes and so, and you know, really nothing. You know, really nothing came out of it. You know, really anything special. 
But um, you know, but that that's pretty much it for the first edition of the Stephen Malcolm Show. I hope you guys have enjoyed the ride. Yeah, I know, you know, the peace, love, and the chicken grease, and, you know, me, like, stuffing my face and, you know, my 5 o'clock shadow with, like, the oily, like, acne, like, right here. Man, this yeah, is it. It's, it's like, freaking it's huge. Your arms. And scratching my arms for the mosquito bites and, you know, me just droning on, rocking back and forth, like, you know, I'm, I'm in a retirement home. You know, like, I'm... <laughs> You know, trying to remember my glory days, so to speak. Yeah, Scott Stein's going to be doing that. Say, I'm hungry. Oh, yeah, you know, Scott, let, let's not forget about about Scott, about Big Papa Pump. You know, you you, know, you might want to be careful, Malcolm. Make fun of him too much, and you're outside the ring. He'll try to do the flying ankle bite. You know, or, you know but then again, that, that, that won't be nothing compared to Mark Henry running, you know, straight forward and outrunning the Nexus and everybody. <laughs> I wonder if that was going to be brought uh, I thought I was going to bring it up. Oh, man. But, um, uh, so, uh, but with that, uh, you know, we really enjoyed finally for all the people that, you know, that wanted this because not going to lie, you know, there's a lot of people that wanted this, the show to actually come into a reality. I mean, a lot. From the, you look on the, the YouTuber three video, you look at the comments. Even Steve said he got a personal message from somebody and said, "You know, when you guys need to stop being lazy and actually do the Stephen Malcolm show." It, it's yeah, funny. no, it, it's like, it, it's funny because it, you know, I I actually thought about that as uh, as I was at work today, Malcolm. I'm like, it's kind of funny because it was like Big Rick and everybody's like. Yo, you know, I think Steve and Malcolm should have their own talk show because it was the simply the fact that, and as I always said, you know, you would do drive-by comments whenever we were doing the main YouTubers three videos. You just would walk into the background, you know, and hold on, I gotta at least do it for old times' sake, just because it it, it amuses me and everybody else. If I can get my fucking headset un, untangled, no, because here's what would happen. You know, here you know, Chris would be saying something, and then here come Malcolm. Hey, look at Steve, he's looking sad. <laughs> you know, doing drive by comments and then Malcolm would get and then you'd get mad, Malcolm, you'd be like, It's not a drive by. I don't have a gun. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then eventually, and then you and I would just start like throwing one-liners and just like trying to bullshit each other. And then finally, people were like, "You know, they ought to get these two. You know, Chris, you got to get you know Malcolm and Steve to do something together." It's like watching the two of them go at each other is just is hilarious to watch. And then you know, you and I even kept saying, you know, maybe there's something there that maybe we should try to exploit. You know, so now it leads all the way up, you know, to this, you know, very first episode. And people kept going like, you know, when is the Stephen Malcolm show going to happen? Is it going to happen soon? Was it all a joke? It's like, nah, you know, you and I were like, man, people really want to see you and I actually, like, either go at each other or, like, just do a straight talk show. Yeah, Something. it was yeah, it was like, you know, people see us saw something was there, you know. It was almost like, you know, you know, that's Stephen Malcolm, you know, you know, there's some chemistry there and I'm like I I'm not, I have no problem with Steve, you know, so you consider you consider each other friends, but man, I'm like, am I seeing something that somebody that everybody I'm missing something that everybody else is seeing? Because my gosh, it was just the, the, they kind of say the fan, you know, the fan appeal that people that was watching the YouTubers three videos really wanted to see this, and now that it's finally here, you know, I, I think that we made we made everybody, you know, happy. So. Well, for the most part, I think most people expected more quibby jabs at each other, but that's, you know, that you know that that that's only on special occasions, really, guys. That's only when like you know the mood strikes us to want to bullshit each other. Right. It's usually it's it's just like Chris always says with the YouTubers three stuff. 
most of the more hilarious or funny stuff that me and Malcolm do completely is off air. That's when the more that's when the most fun stuff happens. You know, making fun of like all these wrestlers, you know, just looking at how bad stuff is. Cuz you know, because you know, because that that's in, in the words of Mark Henry, that's what we do. And we do it well. And I think that's a good way to, to, you know, segue into the finish of the show. Now we don't know when the episode two will will, will be will happen, but we will let you know. And for for you know Steve, this is Malcolm. And before you guys go, wake up, wake up.